Vancouver Island's ever-evolving glam alternative artist Art Deco has a new record out in February called Serene Demon. And we're lucky to have two tracks to dive into so far to give you a preview, but also to give us more of a preview, joining me in the studio is Art Deco. How are you? Tis me. Hello. Hi, Lana. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, uh, well, first off, congrats in advance on the record. Thank you. How does it feel in this like weird time? Like the, this, there's a couple songs out. We're waiting a few months. Yeah, you know, I it, it started writing this record uh, two years ago, over two years ago, mm-hmm. on like a like a janky little piano in the um, in like a rented uh, apartment in in the Lower East Side of New York City, and I was like, you know, this is gonna come out probably in about six months, and then here we are, two over two years later. It's, it it feels weird. I'm a proud little song daddy. I'm watching it grow through gestation and childbirth and um yeah it's got one leg out in the world and half in utero so (laughs) proud song daddy i I quite like that term yeah i don't have any real children and i know the gift of birth is like a real human experience and uh it's the closest (laughs) so far i have to experiencing that through song through songs i i didn't know that you were in uh in new york city what was that like as far as your state of mind and kind of creative environment. I was like, every time I crossed the sidewalk, I was like, I'm walking here, I'm walking. <laughs> you know, like just banging on hoods of like cabs as they like are like, hey, yeah, keep walking. No, it was good. I, I kind of, um, I was, I don't know, I was like in a weird phase of my life and, and I kind of, I wanted to like, you know, I hadn't done a trip for myself in a very long time. It was normally tour, 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 and then home and then tour. And I thought, I'm going to do a trip for me. Mm-hmm. And um, I was really into like film noir and I would like go to bars and talk to strangers and I'd walk the streets at night listening to weird, jazzy, esoteric, obscure movie soundtracks and just get in this mood and this kind of like, I felt like I was like Elaine Delon or like some new wave actor and it was all in my head. But it, I was getting into character to write this album. I think it's interesting because there's, there's definitely a, a clear, with every record, there's a new art deco, it mm. seems. Uh, and so who is Art Deco for this record? I'm me. I think I've fully transitioned in like human man form. The last album was like, you know, I was in my like Ellen DeGeneres, Wayne Gretzky, blonde mulleted, <laughs> okay. um, you know, Aunt, Aunt uh, Susie is coming over and I'm like Aunt Susie. I was like a like a, like a Jane Lynch type character, like a middle-aged lesbian woman with a nice mullet. And now um, before that, I was like, you know, in the Bob Wig phase. But now I feel like I've really come into my own as like I've transitioned into human art deco form, human man, I'm the truest form right now. It feels good. It feels good to be back. Okay. I like, I like that idea of, uh, you know, the different chapters. You did say something that, um, that was in your press that kind of I thought was interesting because you talked about training the ears of your audience and mm-hmm. establishing a new precedent and that kind of moves things forward in a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, but how do you exist in that? paradigm or how do you challenge yourself when you're going from one record to the other knowing that your listeners are coming with you Mm. i don't know i think it's uh there's like a a weird quote a funny quote that um uh what's that producer rick rubin says and he's like you know he says a lot of stuff that contradicts himself like throw out what you know of rick rubin and whatever but there's this one quote that he says is really it's become like kind of like a mental tramp stamp for me on my lower (laughs) <laughs> back um, brain a mental. lot of things are yeah a lot of tattoos back there and this one is um you know the 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 audience comes last like they don't really know what they want they only know what's come before and i find that interesting mm-hmm. like when you're an artist and you start like thinking about the audience as a first pleasure point with what you're writing and what you're creating is you're in kind of like a really weird dangerous territory you're a people pleaser and i am a people pleaser but like the first person i need to please is myself Mm-hmm. And so that uh, that is like a journey into itself, and and hopefully the audience can come along with it, and there's something there for them to uh, to latch onto. But yeah, there's I think that's maybe the pull quote you're referring to is I was just like repackaging what like what Rick Rubin said. For instance, like a Billie Eilish, like could you imagine like a major label think tank like a board? And like Billy and like Phineas come in there and play like bad guy for the first time. Like, could you imagine being what that room, that hypothetical situation would look like? They'd be like, there's no way that it does this and then a weird trap beat and then an 808. Like, no radio station is going to play this Mm -hmm. because what do we compare it to? And it's like, well, they're moving the conversation forward. They didn't care about the audience or you. 
they were doing something cool for them. And, you know, look who's laughing now. I remember a long time ago, someone said, like, the albums are for the band, the shows are for the fans. Mm. And that's why, as an artist, you always have to play the hits. No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it is interesting to think about the, the creative process and truly doing it for yourself and mm-hmm. in your own kind of processing and evolution and trying to... Is it hard to not think about, about the, the audience coming along for the ride then? My tens of fans don't care. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, the... Um, yeah, I mean, I I think where where I'm getting in a, a tricky space now is I'm putting together a, a band to promote this album, do touring and shows and stuff, and what I'm realizing is like there's this craving for live authenticity in the rock and roll genre. For mm-hmm. instance, you know, I love McGee, and he's able to like carve out this interesting space for himself where like he's got him and his guitar, and he is the show, and backing up him up is like a big wall of speakers and a DJ. And his fans are totally fine with that. But for me, it's like I got live blasts of like horns and strings and synthesizers and all that. I'm like, I can't afford to bring a 20 piece band on stage. That's insane. Mm -hmm. So I'm like really trying to figure out like what's fair to the audience and how do I keep things in check for me and organize all that and find those personnel. So that's like a Rubik's Cube. That's like a sonic Sudoku um, problem, a math problem. I'm trying to figure out as we speak. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, because the the album does come out Valentine's Day, uh, which is that is significant, or was it just kind of convenient timing? I love talking to you, Lana, because my ADD brain was about to go even like further off track. Let's bring it back, baby. I mean, we can go off. No, track. no, no. I love it. I love it. Valentine's Day, Saint Valentine's. Um, he the poem that he wrote uh, says, you know, serene demon shall regale us all on Valentine's Day. I'm pretty sure that's in his his gospel. So yeah. Okay, and can we talk about uh, serene demon because that's quite a quite an interesting. It's like a statement. It's a song. It's the album title. What is the the story behind it's a it? Style. It's a lifestyle. It's an architectural a, fad. It's an you, outfit. It's a color. <laughs> sorry. Are you, I'm sorry. You are going to show up and it's like, it is Art Deco. And now this is the vibe for 2025. It is Serene Demon. Yeah. There's going to be a Pantone color of the year that is going to be just for you. Uh, yeah, it's a wallpaper. It's a, it, yeah. Um, the Serene Demon song, Seven and a Half Minutes. Uh, the, yeah, it's it's wild. Um, not Not one to normally lead an album campaign, I know. But I Feel Live isn't on the album, and thank you for playing it so much, you guys. It It's formed sort of this bridge single, and I thought if we just kind of like throw out another kind of three-minute banger from the album, uh, it's going to eat, they're going to fight with each other. Mm. They're going to have a little like, in the char- and not that they're going to both chart or both be on radio, but just like that headspace that I occupy um, neurotically obsessively wanted to kind of pivot into something different. So that song, title track, Mm -hmm. so different, reset. But the vibe, to answer your question, is like, yeah, I wanted it to be like a film noir cinematic kind of uh, aesthetic for the album. Mm -hmm. I mean, the aesthetic too, I felt like for one moment, I was like, oh, there's kind almost like a little Bond villain. Mm, Uh, Very James Bondy. Yeah. Yeah. Which I dig. I always kind of go back to that. Um, I do appreciate the worlds you create, and I'm kind of curious about, uh, so what we have so far is uh, we have Serene Demon, and then um, your latest track as well. The Traveler. The Traveler. What's the... (laughs) I love traveling. Okay. (laughs) Is is it just that basic? Like, I love traveling. I am the traveler. Here we go. Okay, so, you know, the album is like um, a sort of glammed up disco, jazzy sort of... um, Ode to cinema and Serene Demon is, I guess, metaphorically, thematically, you know, just this inner battle with one's inner demons. You know, here we go, here we go. Yeah, there we go. And I played a demon in the music video. You should, you should pause this and check it out. <laughs> Follow the links on the screen because um, I we brought this makeup artist in, Larissa. She was amazing. Three hour makeup job. I did like this crazy. Um, like brow block and like goth paint and a mohawk and it was like I was like Travis Bickle back from the dead and um, you know in the video at some point you discover as the viewer like why am I covered in blood performing this song and then on the way to the concert there's this violent beat down as I encounter my doppelganger and we shot that in Vancouver on Labor Day that one scene ended up like soliciting a 911 call from the VPD they showed up hands on guns like it was 
insane, Lena. It was like we had to shut down production. I got scolded by the sergeant. They're like, you didn't have a permit. You didn't notify us. You didn't notify any of these people. You're out there with this body double. He looks like he's kicking the crap out of you with fake brass knuckles. You're covered in blood. Like, are you insane? You guys could have been shot. And, uh, yeah, later that night, as if to make, as if I could handle any more tongue lashing from the VPD, my sister lives in North Van, shout out Liz, and I was staying at her house. So I'm mm-hmm. driving over the Iron Workers bri- Bridge, covered in blood. If you see the vis- video, you'll get a good, <laughs> and I went through a roadblock. Oh! Another, like another, v- so I th- the VPD, the v- Vancouver Police Department, they're just doing their job, but I was, I was not, I was like a thorn in their side. For that production video but yeah it was like it, there should be a documentary about the making of that video because it was just a crazy it was like a short film mm-hmm. it was wild yeah that is that is absolutely wild <laughs> yeah they're going through the roadblock they're like holy smokes are you okay I'm like no 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 i i swear i'm just i'm, I'm just coming home from set like this is all fake blood don't worry we need worry. to give you some towels and yeah. some like wet wipes like we I gotta know. figure out the situation <laughs> i just like have you had anything to drink and i'm like no but i need a drink after day <laughs> Wow, wow. Well, I mean, if you're going to do something, you're going to go full full, full on. Yeah, I know what you were trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say full on. Yeah, full on. You never go full on, like that famous movie quote. <laughs> uh, well, now I feel alive after that story. Uh, we do need to talk about I Feel Alive. Sure, yeah. Which has been blowing up the airwaves here at Indy 88. Heck yeah. Um, I mean, what's the, I, I like the fact that you have this like bridging sing- single between mm. the two. What came first, though? Was that was it, was it a song that came before the? No, it, it came after. Serene Demon, the album was done, um, and well, no, it was it was in the process. As I look back at my manager, I was in the middle of I was in the midst of recording this album. There was some there was some um, there was a moment where I had to go down to LA to finish it, and then I parted ways with the producer. So I had some free time in LA, and uh, the night before doing a random just creative jamming session with these two musicians a bass player and a drummer um that i had never met before i was like starting to panic like what am i gonna do now like i gotta i gotta come up with something so i kind of on a lark just put up my voice memo and just jammed some chords and mumbled some lyrics and went in and they laid down some bass and drums like super fast brought it back to canada chipped away at it as like a little pet project it's like i'm gonna i'm, I'm like you know gonna scrub the deck and, you know, clean the gutters. It was like house chore. Like, I'll maybe a little chip away at this song. I don't even know what it's called yet. And it was finally finished, and the label and the team and the people that I work with, they were like, this is your catchiest song. We're going to go, we should go to radio. And it'll buy you some time to finish your actual album. And so, you know, here we are talking about said song. <laughs> um, did everything come together really quickly like that? Was this one of those records that... No, I mean okay. this record took a took a while. It took about a full year nose to tail mm-hmm. to complete, to write, to complete. Um, many studios, many personnel. I think like close to forty people played on it. A lot of strings, a lot of horns. Um, so absolutely not is the answer. Yeah, no, no, no sorry. Yeah, you know, it was a lot. It was no, a lot. No, no, I like the detail. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm yeah. curious about collaborations then. Yeah. Uh, because there has been some mention of you know you're a collaborator, but sometimes collaborators. Uh, there, it's it's your art. Sometimes there's there's not an alignment. What do you mm. learn from bringing new people on and and uh, that kind of process, in particular for this record? Yeah. Um, shout out to my bass player and my drummer Malcolm and Pascal, aka the West Coast Boogie Machine, because they really they were my you know guardian angels at many times throughout this and. My music is very bass and rhythm forward, and I that's not my strong suit, so they really actualize it and put it into motion. Uh, and we brought in a lot of, we brought in a producer at one point to kind of like steer the ship, and we went a bit astray, and that's cool too. And you just got to know, if you're a kid out there working on your new record, just know whatever your core values are as an artist, whatever your sound is, don't deviate from that. Write it down, write your manifesto down, put it in a drawer, fold that paper and keep it away for a rainy day. Because sometimes when you are like a ship, kind of a ghost ship at night, like running off course and you don't have that load star to guide you, pull that out, read it, be like, okay, this is who I am and I've got to make these decisions. So I, I kind of did that throughout the course of this record, but the the core, the people that were really on board with the sound and wanted to help it and see the vision through, I'm forever grateful for, yeah. 
What is the Art Deco Manifesto? Ooh, it's spooky. No, uh, <laughs> or is that too personal? Is that no. maybe that's something that you need to to hold close? Um, I would. Ways. Yeah, no, it's like a it's a fair question. I would say you know, um, I I work really, really, really tirelessly hard on every little decision from the font to the photo shoots to the music videos. I'm involved with the mixing, with the mastering, because what happens is like. I say this all the time. It's like, I'm not a one-man show. I have a whole bunch of people helping me, a whole bunch of talented, really, really good musicians helping me. As a solo artist, you need to, unless you're like a crazy multi-instrumentalist. But even Prince, as he was, had a great team around him of musicians. What ends up happening is, you know, in the collaborative process, people have an opinion about, you know, a certain sound or a certain thing that should happen in that. And everybody's just chipping in and doing their job. But if it doesn't... Stick to the vision and doesn't jive with you. It's okay to say no. I'm going to override it with my idea, and and sometimes that conflict, that friction, makes really good art. But at the end of it, when it's released, if some of those decisions get panned by critics and people, you know, really like thumbs down it, you can't throw those people under the bus. You can't say, well, that one thing you don't like was my bass player's idea. That was all him. I'm Art Deco, though. My name's going on the front of the album. And so it's like you share the glory with add the team and you take full responsibility if it if it fails. So by virtue of that, it's incumbent upon you to like really know your stuff and really stick to your core values. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you definitely did. And it sounds like you're also really uh, excited to get this out to the world. Yeah. Can I ask you about the the favorite? I mean, can, in addition to that very memorable music video experience, mm. Uh, anything when you look back on the creation of the record? As we are in this, this like, what did you call it? Uh, music Daddy? No, what a you, song Daddy. <laughs> song Daddy. Uh, as we're in this Song Daddy phase, um, as you're waiting for it to go out into the world, uh, is there something you look back and you're like, yeah, this is... Mm. Yeah, I mean, I as much fun as I had at times and as as the, the highs were high, the lows were low, um, I'm grateful to not have to see Malcolm with his shirt off in the, you know, sweating out <laughs> takes 75 of, of some of these songs. But, uh, you know, like joking aside, yeah, the whole experience was like, I'm, I'm definitely richer for having gone through it. Yeah. yeah, it was high. It was all it was all a highlight. It was all a low light. It was just it was life. It was living, baby. It's a process, right? Yeah. Amazing. Well, we're excited for you to figure out. I know you, we mentioned this earlier, uh, how to take the album onto the stage. Mm. that process and what that looks like. Are we looking at 2025? I mean, I haven't heard the whole record because it's not out yet. I'm mean, uh. so curious now to hear more. Yeah, the we'll be coming to Toronto at some point in 2025. A lot of tour dates in the works cooking up. Yeah. So uh, when you do see us, depending on what city you're in, what continent you're on, it could be as small as like a six-piece band, as big as like a 10 or nine, 10 piece band. Yeah, depending on depending on the location. So we are playing the heck out of I Feel Alive. There's something so great about that beat. It is just, it truly does make you feel, not to sound cheesy, but it brings you that joie de vivre in some ways. Um, but again, that's just my interpretation. Art Deco, can you bring us to this this track? What were, where, where were you like? Where were you like? What were you like during the process of getting this together? Um, thank you. Uh, I came together. It's the genesis of it happened in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, this band called Sure Sure, they played bass and drums on it, um, brought it back to Victoria, you know, chipped away, chipped away. I really, um, my good friend Jeff Mitchellmore heard like an early demo of it. He plays in a band called Golden Youth. You might remember yeah, those guys. Yeah. And he said, he's like, you know, there's a melody that you sing in that pre chorus, and I crave hearing it, and you need to bring that back in the chorus. And and I think until that moment happened, the melodic structure hadn't really codified. And um, so, yeah, uh, had a lot of like good feedback from some people that I trusted, and one thing led to another. Here we are. Do you often record outside of? your hometown or where you live out of victoria out of victoria and then bring everything back is it kind of like a piecemeal yeah you need that yeah they all come home to roost right some of the some of the there are tracks in my catalog that were literally recorded or conceptualized in a hotel room on a train walking down the um you know in the rain (laughs) train rain right and you just you pull out your phone and it's a voice memo and next thing you know it turns into a song yeah the create you gotta have your antenna pulled at all times and you know, lightning might strike at any moment. So, do you still have that voice note with you? Uh, for I feel alive. Yeah, yeah, I could probably pull. I mean, there's fifteen hundred of them in here. I was just <laughs> looking through them the other day. But yeah, there's um, there's yeah, there's. If you ever want to have fun with your friends who are musicians, play voice memo roulette. 
Ooh, I love that. They spin it, like zap, 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 and scroll. And then when you say stop, they have to stop it and play whatever it is. <gasps> it is the most... I'm di- I'm sweating right now thinking about it. Okay, I think I might have to do this on my show. You're... <laughs> do we want to start this? I, I mean... Can we do... Let's do voice memo roulette. If I see... I, I'll play maybe if I can find I Feel Live voice memo. Um, you would just find... I have voice memos that I just deleted that were of my cat from 2012. No way. Just being noisy. His name was Leonard. This is me killing time while you find out the, uh, if you can find the I Feel Alive memo. <laughs> oh my God. I don't even want to. No stress. No stress. If you can't. That says. That's, that's so good. Uh, thank you. That's, that's August 12th, 2023. That's literally the night before I did, did that. So I was talking to the mic, did that session. So uh, my hands are shaking with nerves, but uh, there you go. Wow. That's that's the first time that came out of my mouth. And now we're talking about that song. Incredible. Yeah, I feel like we just did a song exploder right now. <laughs> uh, sign me up. Sign yeah, me up. One song. How does it feel to sing that track live? Because I sing it, you know, in the studio on my own. But there is something really kind of celebratory. Mm. Well, uh, we haven't played it live yet. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But okay. in the new year, we will. Right? Yeah, we will. I'm looking <laughs> back at my manager. Right? Book Confirmed? Those. Yeah, confirm. Can we talk about it? Toronto sometime in 2025. Uh, Definitely, definitely. And you're going to be there and you're going to be there. And uh, yeah, everybody listening, hopefully will know about it. Amazing. Well, that was fun. Yeah. Voice memo roulette. Okay. And then uh, if you don't mind, so we got actually, we got some good stuff with Serene Demon already because I talked about the title track. Cool. So that's cool. Um, But can we bring up The Traveler? Yeah. So, I mean, talking about the creation of your album, it seems like you are a traveler. Again, we brought up the fact that you're often, you know, putting your antenna out there and you've got your notes and collaborations, but you've kind of come home to roost. Uh, What about The Traveler? Themes of escape, adventure. Um, I feel like the, the head of the snake with this record is like these moody sort of existentialist, sort of deep, heady sort of ideas. But within that umbrella, you have nihilism, escapism, romanticism, all these rushing rivers of creativity. And there I am in like the little confluence and my little my Huck Finn song craft trying to make sense of it all. And I feel like The Traveler was just like a fun, bouncy way to kind of like, you know, veer off tangent for a little bit and go on a trip. And I pictured like Catch Me If You Can, the movie-esque 1960s sort of like montages where there's like, you know, a map and like, you know, I'd be running across the map and like boats and planes and trains, very like spy flick. So that was going through my head when I wrote it. And uh, I'm glad the video, shout out John Smith for for kind of like taking that information, and putting it through his little gadgetry and coming up with the video at the end. You're such a cinematic uh, thinker. Mm. So when it comes to getting what's in your head onto paper, is there a particular uh, piece of art you flock to? I always use movie references, Lana. Yeah. It's it like the music video directors and teams that I work with are like, they they kind of like are, they get a giggle out of it because I'll write a treatment and it'll be screenshots of all these movies and I'll like get really granular about like the lenses they used and like you got to check out this thing about like the street lighting in America and how it affected film noir in 1970, <laughs> like all this nerdy stuff. So yeah, I use movie references. They definitely are like almost as important as. Music references. Does every album, do you think, have an overarching film reference to it? Many film references. I so mean, it's the, always multiple. Yeah, it's always yeah. multiple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the Traveler. The one little fun note I will say about the Travelers. Those are real marimbas, which are like a really cool instrument. They're like a mallet instrument. They're really orchestral. They look like a giant xylophone, like big long wooden rosewood kind of rods, and you play with a mallet. They're really expensive. Like rosewood's actually like an endangered wood now. It's almost like ivory. You can't even bring the uh, rosewood into like America in certain amounts above a certain weight. And so my friend Neil in the band Astra Color in Victoria has a studio and his grandfather, his great grandfather had a uh, marimba. And I was like obsessed with the sound that it makes. So that dong, 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 dong in the traveler, that's a real marimba. I went to his, his studio for like a day and we like had me banging around on it. It was like a real treat to use this kind of like weird orchestral instrument that's super rare to find. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Are there any other surprising instruments that that showed up that we wouldn't perhaps 
mm. without asking you? Or did you steal anything? <laughs> Uh, did like an, I egg, an egg shaker from oh, someone's studio. This is the the <laughs> sacred egg, egg shaker of. Uh, I like how that's where my mind went. Yeah, I, I was like, it's not a, nothing as cool as like a marimba. Yeah. I was like the uh, egg shaker. This from- egg shaker came from the the cast of Wicked. <laughs> <laughs> it's spooky. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. there was none of that. I mean, that I can think of. I can make something up. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, all right, and let's talk. Um, I'd love to talk about True Believer. Yeah, True Believer. So bring us back to the to this one. This one's um, uh, leads off the album. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's like uh, it's. It, I was in the play The Wizard of Oz with my my little sister Liz was Dorothy, grade six, Hampton Hampton Elementary School. Shout, shout out. out. <laughs> yeah, a lot of shout outs on this interview. And um, um, this, the, the Wizard of Oz, the movie The Wizard of Oz, like, I love it. I think it's such a cool, it's my favorite sort of like fantasy fable story and like the messaging and like the, the movie of it is amazing. Judy Garland, everybody's seen it. Even Dark Side of Oz, sinking mm-hmm. it. Like, have you ever done the sinking to like Dark Side of the Moon with yeah. Wizard of Oz? And that so, was in high school. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but pretty fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's super fascinating. Yeah, totally watched it sober, obviously, wink, wink. And um, the there's this, like, sort of like, dun, 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 dun. there's, like, this spooky kind of, like, carnival-y thing that has always been, like, ingrained in my musical DNA, and you hear it on a lot of my music. There's, like, this, my drummer Malcolm calls, like, oh, that Art Deco clown town stuff. And so True Believer is, like, peak deco, Clown Town, Carnival Barker, Synthy, where like you'll hear the melodies now that I've said The Wizard of Oz, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's so, that sounds like a spooky Halloween haunted house in like an 80s movie, like in Stranger Things. And it's, yeah, that's that's where that song comes from. Well, we're just excited to see you on that stage and we're excited to hear more. So we will get to, uh, to more of the new tracks and thank you, of course, for uh, coming in. Thanks for having me. So nice to see you. Likewise.